week, we read in Luke's account of when Jesus rode on a donkey, on a donkey's foal to be exact, into Jerusalem at the beginning of the week of Passover. And in doing so, Jesus was rightfully proclaiming himself to be the sovereign king because he was fulfilling the scriptures that, that said the king was coming and that's how he would come. In particular, in Zechariah 9, 9, the passage says, Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So by Jesus riding in that way, he was proclaiming himself what the scriptures said he would be. He was the king. Today I want us to look at the second day of that week. Now Matthew tells us in his gospel that each day Jesus and his disciples uh, would come into Jerusalem, but at night they would go back out and stay overnight and lodge in Bethany, and then to get up the next morning and come back in. So on the second day, Jesus didn't ride in on a donkey. He had already done that for <coughs> himself king. He comes in on the second day, and this is where the passage picks up not a lot of description, but this is what happened on the second day. If you have your Bibles, it's in uh, the 19th chapter of Luke, Luke 19, 45 through 48. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all of those who were selling, saying to them, it is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer. But you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do. For all the people were hanging on to every word that he said. So we find him in the temple, and he dry, he's driving out. We we'll talk about who was there, but he's driving these people out, those who were in there coming. <clears throat> Mark adds a little extra information when he accounts the story, because his account. He says that Jesus wouldn't even let anybody come through the courtyard carrying any goods. And Matthew tells us that he started overturning the tables and all the chairs. Man, I'm going to tell you, he was sending people running from his wrath. So the question is, why in the world was Jesus so angry? What was it that provoked such anger in what was otherwise a meek and humble character? Now the people who were there and who were there doing business in the temple, they were, first of all, primarily money changers. Money changers. The Jewish law required that every adult male had to pay a temple tax every year. It's a half a shekel. Here's the cash. You had to pay it in Jewish money. Now, if you lived in the Roman Empire, everything you bought and sold was with Roman money. So when you showed up to Jerusalem to pay your tax, all you had was Roman money. Ah, oh, but they were so set up, they were so loving and kind and considerate, they were willing to exchange the Roman money for the Jewish money. At a fee. And it was very expensive for them to change that money over. They were stuck in a rock and a hard place. They had to do it. They could charge anything they want. There have been stories they paid as much as 15% just to change the money over from one to the other. Second group of people who would have been there at the temple. These were people who had set up little booths and had pens and stuff set up and had animals in it. They had lambs and then they had uh, cages with doves in it on their tables. And these lambs and these doves had already been pre-approved for sacrifice. They were considered to be acceptable. These were the good ones. Now you've got to imagine if you had to travel for weeks or even months to get to Jerusalem, it had been hard to take a bunch of livestock with you. You had a group of maybe four or five families, and everybody's bringing their lamb, or if they were poor, they got to carry their cages with the doves in them. 
And so rather than go through all of that, it was so much easier. Because you had to feed and water them all the way. It was expensive too. It was so much easier if you just showed up and got there in Jerusalem and you could purchase one of the lambs or the doves that had already been pre-approved. The priest had already inspected it and determined that it was without blemish. Here's the other problem. If you took your own, you were at the mercy of the inspector. You can say, here's my sheep. I'll tell you, I picked out the best one I got. He's like looking at the teeth. I, I think I see. No, I'm sorry. Can't use that. You're going to have to buy one of these. So not only did you pay to bring it, you got to pay to take it back. Very expensive. And you had no guarantee that the ones you brought, matter of fact, most of the ones that people brought, for some reason, just didn't make the cut. And again, it wasn't like they were charging a fair price for the lambs and doves. After all, there is a limited supply, but they would sell thousands and thousands of animals. Can you imagine how loud and smelly the temple was to hold and pin all those animals? Also, there's a third group of folks that were there at the temple that Jesus was upset with. And these were vendors, people selling stuff, selling fabrics, selling pottery, bread, uh, maybe some vegetables, uh, 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 oils, olive oil, different kinds of oils and, and spices. And they would have little booths set up and work with some of y'all, because my wife does craft shows. And so what you do is you, you purchase a place, a spot, okay, you buy the booth. And then in a lot of the shows, you also have to pay a percentage of what you sell during the show. Well, it worked just like that in Jerusalem. People would negotiate with the temple priest and with the high priest to find out if you paid enough money, you could get one of the spots. And again, they were limited. They couldn't, you know, maybe there could only be 50 or 100 or 20. But they were limited, so people would bid on and get the franchise to have that spot. And then whatever they sold, they had to pay a percentage. And all this money also went to the high priest. So all the money that came from the money changers, and all that money that was earned by the people selling all that livestock, and all that money that was charged a percentage of what they sold plus what they paid to get the booth, all of that money went into the pockets of the high priest. The reason why they were so upset when Jesus was in there and people were starting to follow him and listen to him. And that's why the passage said, but they, all the, when they saw Jesus in doing this stuff, they realized, we're in trouble. There goes my income stream. There goes my, my, my retirement right there. And they would, we got we to get rid of this guy. So why was Jesus so angry at all these people who were there? Now, I do not think he was pleased to see these people taking advantage of his Jewish brothers and sisters. Remember, no Gentile would be in there buying and selling lambs and pigeons and stuff. Some might have come in to, to buy some fabrics, but basically this was a, at the temple. This was a Jewish thing. And they were certainly guilty of robbing hundreds of thousands of people who flooded into Jerusalem each year for the Passover. So they were guilty of robbing these people. But robbing the people wasn't what lit the fuse of the fire of Jesus that day. He was irate. He was enraged because they were robbing God. The temple was built as a series of courts. In the center, kind of back towards the back, but in the center, uh, there was a court. And that was the court of the priests. And only the priests could go back in that court. And inside of that court was an area called the holy place. And inside the holy place was the holy of holies. So only the priests could go back in that court. That's where all that stuff was. Uh, the, the next court out from that, that one was called the court of Israel. And Jewish men could go into that court. Because in the court of the priest, that's where they would make, burn the incense. That's where they would do their offerings and stuff like that. So if you were a Jewish male and you brought your offering and you could take it up to the gate, you could go into the court of Israel. 
But you couldn't go into the court of the priest, and you had to give your sacrifice, and then they would take it to the altar and do all that stuff, and then you would leave. And outside of the court of Israel was another court, and it was called the court of the women. And that's where Jewish women could go. Now, they couldn't step through the veil, through the gate, to go into the court of Israel. Only the men could go there, and the men couldn't go into the next one. So they had the court of the women, and all the Jewish women were there. Outside of that, you kind of see how the rings are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Outside of that was the largest of all the courts. And it was the court of the Gentile. Now, no Gentile could go from that into the court of the women. You had to be a Jewish woman to go there. They certainly couldn't go any further. Matter of fact, they had a sign up that said, basically, if you step through this gate, you are responsible for your own demise. You know what demise yeah. Okay. So out in the court of the Gentiles, that's where all of these money changers were, and all of the animals, and all the animal brokers, and all of the vendors, and they were all out there. Matter of fact, there was so much merchandising going on, it was no longer called the court of the Gentiles. It had become known as the Bazaar of Annas, the high priest. And even though at this point in time, Annas was no longer the high priest, his son was, it's still because they sold all of the spots and they made so much money and just would become a, just a giant bazaar. You ever seen on TV a Middle Eastern bazaar? Mm -hmm. You know, all the tents and people are arguing and haggling over prices and animals, all of, that's what the court of the Gentiles looked like. Except it didn't have Indiana Jones running through it. <laughs> Jesus went in and he was outraged. And he began chasing them out of there and he used a quote. It's in verse 46. And that quote comes from two quotes that are found in the Old Testament. Now the very first part of that, because remember Jesus started this by saying it is written. Well, there wasn't a New Testament then, so it had to, if it's written, it had to be Old Testament, right? So the first part of that is, my house shall be a house of prayer. Jesus quoted that. Now, if you were to approach the temple in Jerusalem, it looked anything but like a temple and a house of prayer. All of the commotion and all that was going on there. Yelling, screaming, shouting, kids running all over the place. Animals, smell. That's not what God intended and designed his, tape, his temple to be. <clears throat> the money changers, the vendors, uh, the animal set, they could have set up shop. There's plenty of other places in Jerusalem to do all of this. So it was, while Jesus, I'm sure, wasn't happy that they were doing it, this is not the primary reason why he was enraged. It was because where they were doing all of this. And that's why he quoted that passage. It comes from Isaiah, the 56th chapter. My house shall be a house of prayer. Now, if you read Isaiah 56, you get the context of what this comes from, what this is, this is describing. This is just a little portion of it. From Isaiah 56, in that passage, the Lord is talking about and to the Gentiles. And the passage says, even to them, even to the Gentiles, I will bring to, I will bring Gentiles to my holy mountain. And I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. God is saying, I've got a temple, and I'm going to even bring Gentiles to my temple. I'm bringing, yes, yes, even them. I am bringing, and I am going to make them joyful in this temple, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. And this was the quote that Jesus was using. He said, wait a minute. This is supposed to be the temple that has the courtyard for the Gentiles. And they had changed this and, and converted where the Gentiles were supposed to be coming and hearing about God and getting the blessings of God and hearing about their Creator and pulling away from their false religions and coming to Jehovah God. This is where it was supposed to be happening. 
They couldn't even get in the place because it was just a crazed market. They were supposed to be hearing about the salvation, the promise of salvation from God. This is a place where they were supposed to go and pray and commune with God. God the, the Most High. And instead they barely squeezed into this little court that was crowded and full of chaos and confusion. There was no place for the Gentiles to come. They robbed God of the very place that God invited them to come. It'd be like you invite some friends over. They get in the door, you knock on the door, you open the door and say, hey, you know, I voted a bunch of people. There's no room for you. You've got to go home. That's all right. This is what happened. God has been inviting them. They were supposed to be invited, but they, they made sure that they couldn't. So then you have the second part of the quote that Jesus gives there in 46. And he says, but you have made it a robber's den. Now this is not taken from Isaiah. It's taken from the uh, seventh chapter of Jeremiah. And there in that passage, three times, the Lord, you know, the Lord says something three times is important. You know, when the angels are worshiping uh, in, in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy. You know, when you say something twice in the Bible, that means you pay attention. Jesus always said, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say this. I mean, if I say it twice, pay attention. You say it three times. Oh, wow. Three times in Jeremiah 7, the Lord says, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Some of us have a hard time hearing, or we're not paying attention. Three times he says it. And Jeremiah is repeating this, these words of the Lord standing in front of the temple. It is supposed to be a sanctuary where sinners come to approach God. That's what the temple was. Remember what was all the way in the very center? It was the Holy of Holies. It was the dwelling place of God, the Shekinah glory of God. This was the, where the Ark of the Covenant was located. And the Gentiles were supposed to be coming from all the lands and all the nations and coming to the temple to hear about God. It's supposed to be a sanctuary for believers and it had become a sanctuary for swindlers. Charlatans, thieves, grubby, grubby money grubbers. It was supposed to be where God went to meet, where man went to meet God. Where man was supposed to go and worship God. It was supposed to be a place where you went to draw near and close to God. But their greedy and shallow religion had robbed God of the very place where man could go and have that experience. And because of that, the temple no longer served its purpose. It was no longer needed. Once Jesus came, he didn't need the temple anymore. Because Jesus has become the temple that mankind is so desperate for. In Jesus, we can approach the throne and the throne room of grace, where God resides. In Jesus, we can learn about the, the human qualities and the attributes that we are supposed to, to share with our brothers and sisters and those around us. Gentleness, humility, kindness, mercy, grace, forgiveness. And it's in Jesus we can offer up our prayers knowing that in Him they will be heard. It's not that long after this event. That the city of Jerusalem will be utterly destroyed and the temple utterly destroyed. Remember we talked last week, not one stone would be left on another. Love it. You see, Jesus had come. Didn't need the other temple. 
the other temple wasn't doing what it was supposed to do anyway. It was no longer useful. It was no longer even needed because of Christ. We come to Christ in order to be the earth to God. He is our temple, both now and forever. If you flip all the way to the back of the Bible, not all the way back, that's got maps. Almost all the way back, back to the, the Revelation, towards the end, at least the last chapter of Revelation, right at the end, Revelation 21, 22. They're describing, John is describing the vision that he has been given of the new Jerusalem that comes down. And he spends a little time describing, it's got some, it's got stuff, but it's different. You know, it's got walls. Well, the other one had walls, but these walls are different kind of walls. And it's got gates. Well, the other one had gates, but this has got different kind of gates. So he goes through and he's describing the walls and describing the gates. And then it's like he's looking around, and all of a sudden he goes, you know, I'll tell you what else is different. I don't see a temple. There ain't no temple in New Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 22 says, And I saw no temple in it. Did God forget? Run short on funds? Had to cut some corners? I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, are its temple. You don't need to go to a building. God is right there. Jesus is right there. He replaced the temple. It was only a symbol for mankind to, to have until he showed up. And now, if we want to draw close to God, if we want to pray, if we want to commune, all of these things, all we have to do is go to Jesus. And there's a little couple pieces of evidence that the temple wasn't it anymore. From the other accounts, we read that once Jesus had cast out the money changers and the vendors and the animals and the animal salesmen, once that, a couple of things started happening that are a picture of the perfect temple. Well, the first one it says that people who were sick and hurting came to him and they were all healed. You know, when we come to Jesus now, our greatest sickness and illness isn't a physical one, although we got a bunch of that stuff. It's our spiritual. And if we come to Him and we're hurting because of our sins, He will heal us, every single one. And then in the other accounts too, there was a passage, I believe it was in John's account, that says that there were many Greeks, Gentiles, who came and said, we wish to see Jesus. See, so they couldn't get, even get in the temple before. The Jews had closed it off. It made it impossible. And Jesus came and said, this temple, we don't need. I'm the temple. And we have the record of the Greeks coming and saying, went to one of his disciples, and they said, we, we wish to see Jesus. We, we need to see him. <clears throat> A church building is just a building. Unless Jesus is here. Because he's the temple. And a Christian is just a person. Unless the world can find Jesus there. God has called us, his church, out of the darkness and into the light so that the world will want to come and see the light in the same way that those who were hurting suddenly had to go see Jesus. Those who needed to have a spiritual need, they had to go see Jesus. And we should be that light in our communities and in our families and in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces that people would see us and go, I need to see Jesus. Where can I find him? They should be able to find him and he's one of us. And they should know that he's there. Folks, if they know he's there, when they figure out that they need him, they're going to come to you. 
as kind of the system that God has set up. In Peter's letter, he writes and describes Christians as being living stones. We talked about gallstones. We talked about kidney stones. We're supposed to be living stones, which are being built up to be a spiritual building. That spiritual building is the temple of Jesus Christ, of which he is the head and we are the body. So when a hurting world needs to find Jesus, all they need to do is go to the temple. It's the church where Jesus is. The Bible tells us we're supposed to be uh, bear fruit, so we're supposed to be fruity. But I would also say that we also need to have some veggie qualities in us too because we are called to produce something. So we need to be produce. <laughs> and I'll give you three heads of lettuce that you need to be. Let us not fail in our purpose. Let us not rob God. And let us always Remember to be the very place where others can come and find Jesus. For today, we are the outer court, which leads many to Christ our Lord. But just remember, He's the temple. In fact, He's the righteous holy of holies. Now, Father God, we thank you for your scripture and your word. Lord, we thank you for the responsibility that you give us. Lord, that we might be the way that people come to hear about you. We thank you for that awesome calling. Help us, Lord, each and every day to continue to be built up spiritually. That people around us know where they can find Jesus when they need him. And they will need him. That they will see him in us. And we will eagerly and anxiously be awaiting to share them in such a way to heal them from their hurts and to help them in their pain and to give them eternal life. Father, thank you for loving us and allowing us to serve you. It's in Christ we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.